Sunny Arena with Heritage Preservation. We have a really, really great webinar planned for you all today. Um, but before we get to the topic, let me just uh, quickly introduce the online community uh, in case you're joining us for the first time, although I see a lot of familiar faces. So the Connecting to Collections online community was originally created in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services and is moderated by Heritage Preservation. Learning Times produces both the website and our webinars. You know, the goal of the online community has always been to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and to network with their colleagues. And to help you do that, we've compiled, compiled an extensive list of online resources. They're broken up by topic on our website, which you can see up here at the top. Uh, and we also have an archive of every webinar we've ever hosted that you're welcome to go back to at any time to, to glean all that fantastic information. And today's webinar will also live on this webinar archive, so you can go back to it. Now, as I said, we have a really fantastic webinar planned for you today. If you participated in our online course on outreach, this is a fantastic follow-up to the information presented by Dana. Uh, but if you didn't, don't worry. Our speakers have uh, done a great job of showcasing social media um, and how you can use it to promote your preservation activities. So we hope you'll get a lot of great ideas that you can use at your own institution. So without further delay, I am so pleased to introduce you all to our speakers today. We have on board uh, Heather Brown and Sam Skelton. Uh, Heather and Sam are currently fellows in the Winterthur University of Delaware Program in Art Conservation, and they are also uh, in the process, they are advanced conservation interns at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. I know I have missed a lot, but if you guys would like to share more with the audience, please feel free to do so. Um, but we do have a lot of ground to cover today, so I am just going to pull this out of the way, and I'm going to hand things over to you, uh, Heather and Samantha. Okay, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. <clears throat> My name is Heather, um, and I'm a photography conservation intern at DMSA Houston, and Samantha works in paintings. So I'm just going to be starting this off, and then I'll turn it over to Samantha, and we'll alternate back and forth throughout the rest of the presentation. If you have any questions at all, please post them in the chat box to the lower left, and we'll get to as many as we can during the hour. Okay, so as Jenny mentioned, Samantha and I are both conservation graduate students. And in our University of Delaware program, they really encourage us to become more involved with conservation outreach. For example, we started um, a class blog using WordPress, and I presented a poster on using social media for outreach at the recent AIC ICOM CC Photo Materials Group meeting in New Zealand. This poster presented case studies of web platforms that can successfully be used for conservation outreach, and it really forms the basis of this webinar. To emphasize the purpose of social media outreach, here are definitions. Social media are websites and other online forms of communication that share information and develop contact. Outreach is the act of extending services to a large population. Um, and I take services to mean the mission of your institution, so that's usually something like to collect objects, to preserve them, and to make them accessible for educational purposes. So your job is then to figure out how to creatively use social media to better achieve those goals. I thought it'd be interesting just to show how Samantha and I use social media in our personal and professional lives. So I made these tables. On the left-hand column, you see the sites that we actually contribute to, and on the right-hand column, the sites that we use more to read and to learn from. Um, I was pretty surprised how long the list is, but um, I realized that most of the links that we get come from friends who are emailing us or from finding pages during research. So there's a lot of information out there on the web. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it over to Samantha, so and she'll tell you more about today's webinar. Okay, thank you, Heather. Um, I'm just going to quickly recap last week's Connecting to Collections webinar on social media outreach with Dana Allen Greel. Uh, some of you may have participated in this webinar, so I'll keep this short but there were a lot of excellent resources and tips in it, so I encourage you to watch the archived webinar if you didn't have a chance to see it last week. Um, the overarching theme was definitely smart planning. Dana emphasized creating a well-defined plan for your approach to social media before you start, 
or if you've already started but you're looking to improve your approach. So first you should sit down and define who you want to reach in terms of an audience and what outreach goals you'd like to achieve through social media. Also, deciding how you'd like to present yourself is an important part of the planning process. So you need to decide on a consistent voice for your institution to present on these platforms. This typically um, is more casual and more candid than your standard public relations voice as the informality of most social media outlets generally calls for a more casual tone. Um, then you need to decide which platforms are most conducive to your needs in terms of your desired audience and the content you have to present. Um, once you've got a plan in place, you need to develop your content and begin sharing it. And then you need to keep up with how well you're doing, so you should take advantage of the available analytical tools many of these sites provide to determine your level of success. And then you can use that data to make adjustments and continue to improve your reach. So here's just some snippets um, that I took away from Dana's webinar that I thought were especially helpful. Uh, number one is for when you're defining your target audience. Um, everyone is not exactly a useful demographic. Uh, if that is your demographic, then Facebook is probably your best bet, um, but ideally you should be a little more specific than that. Uh, the second tip, and this is a big one, is that images tend to have the most impact across all platforms. Um, so if ever in doubt, always go with an eye-catching image. And um, then there was a lot of discussion regarding cross-posting the same content on several platforms. And I think the takeaway uh, from Dana's webinar was that cross-posting is definitely something that you should be doing, but you should do so conscientiously and judiciously. Um, content should be tailored to each platform, and it should be laid out in your plan how and where you'll cross-post so that you're not just plastering the same kind of cookie cutter content over every site that you use. You also want to improve your audience, uh, I'm sorry, involve your audience wherever you get the chance. And some excellent ways to do that are to have contests or votes or have scheduled events um, like an Ask the Expert event with your curators or conservators or archivists on Facebook or Reddit. Um, also, if you want to have your fans um, forward your message on, then you should tell them to do so by saying the words retweet or share um, within the first 90 characters of your post. Uh, Dana also mentioned that very short posts tend to get the best results, and this doesn't just apply to Twitter, um, but across every platform, brevity is usually the most successful. So you also want to be regular and fairly frequent with your posts. Uh, you don't want to have a situation where you post every day for three months and then disappear for six months because you might lose the fan base that you've already built up. Um, the next one is obviously a little uh, <laughs> self-evident, um, but you want to post meaningful content. And we already discussed um, deciding on your institutional voice, but it's important to note, as Dana said, um, the Internet loves funny. So clever things or things that teach us something or make us happy, those types of posts tend to get the best results. Um, these are the sites that she covered in depth, and she uh, included a lot of statistics with demographics for each platform and other useful information. So it's definitely worthwhile to watch um, Dana's course when it becomes available on the Connecting to Collections site. Today we're going to talk about many of these sites as well as some others, but mostly we're going to show you the way other institutions are using these platforms successfully. So we've broken it down into a few categories like sharing images or sharing ideas, and we've included a few tips throughout the presentation that will help you get started. And now I'm going to turn it over to Heather who will tell you about the best ways to share news and facts. Okay, great. Thank you. So that brings us to our first category, which is titled Sharing Information, News, and Facts. What's great about the following websites is that you can use them to update your fans about current events at your institution. Things like Thursday happy hour or Friday film screenings might attract a new audience that has never actually been to the museum before. Um, you can connect with your fans and build your audience by spreading through their friends. 
you can teach your fans trivia or little facts that might make them more intrigued to visit the museum. And you can engage your fans with surveys and questions that help them to feel connected and possibly even more motivated to donate. So I realize that uh, some of you aren't in museums, but I hope the examples that I'm sharing are applicable to libraries, archives, galleries, and any other type of organization. So my first case study is Facebook, and I understand that a good number of you already use Facebook, but that's even more reason to ensure that your Facebook campaign is successful because you have a lot of potential fans who are also using the site, um, and you'll get the most bang for your buck by reaching them through this platform. Here we're looking at the homepage for the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, or CCAHA, in Philadelphia. Their regional center that offers treatment and housing services for works on paper, as well as uh, preservation services. You'll see here that they have over 2,700 likes, which is um, pretty good for a regional center of their size. Um, and every time someone likes a page or post, and that's an opportunity for one of their friends to see it and like it as well. So CCAHA posts about events that are happening at the center, like this open house that was scheduled for last week. And then they also followed up with the event to encourage RSVPs and also to post photos following the event. And this is great for people that couldn't make it there or maybe just interested in behind the scenes of a conservation center. CCAHA also posts videos, images, and other content like this graphic here at the center uh, that comes from a preventive conservation poster they created and it shows the effects of humidity and temperature on objects. So finally, they also post content from other organizations or about broad subjects or related to conservation. These type of posts can easily be planned in advance and scheduled through Facebook, as Samantha mentioned. So they go up at regular intervals, um, so you can plan ahead and get this done at maybe the beginning of the week, and then posts still go up through the weekend when nobody's in the office. It's important to stay as consistent as possible, because not only will the majority of your fans be using Facebook, Facebook excuse me, but it's often considered a home base for social media, a place uh, you post links to your various other websites. The next example I have is Twitter, which offers the most up-to-date news and facts using 140 characters or less. Some Twitter users, or Tweeble, as they're sometimes called, will tweet on the hour with the most current events happening in their lives. Institutions, on the other hand, use Twitter more as an advertising tool to offer short bursts of information, sometimes with links that go to other sites. So I chose a Twitter site for MFA Houston, where I'm currently working, um, because I do have a job of keeping the tweets regular. Here's an example of a tweet about an upcoming event that links back to the museum's website. Let's see, and another where you've used images, where they've used images to attract the viewer to a marketing campaign for the cafe. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Twitter, the at sign is used to link to another account. Um, so that's highlighted in blue, and you can click on it and be taken to the account page. And then the pound sign, or hashtag, was invented by Twitter to tag your posts with a certain category, and also allows you to click on the hyperlink and see all related tweets. In this case, um, it's about the Coleman Mosier exhibition currently at the MFA age. Another way that you could use the hashtag is to schedule live chats in advance or assign a hashtag to an upcoming conference or event that you want people to tweet about. Speaking of engagement, I couldn't resist adding this in because it's such a creative use of Twitter. And it was likely planned in advance because the visitors weren't supposed to take photos in the Terrell exhibition. Um, but you can see what kind of response it was getting. People were pretty excited. Um, and I also wanted to point out the RT at the beginning of the post, which means retweet. So they're taking the tweet and posting it on their own site. And that happens with a couple of those. So even LACMA is retweeting here. And then the original post shows how many retweets there at the bottom. So next I have LinkedIn. And many people use this only as a professional networking site. But it also functions to build an audience for your work and among people who have similar interests. This is the page for the INCA, or International Network for the Conservation of Contemporary Art Education Network. From the main page, um, anyone can post a discussion. So this one is asking if anyone has ever interviewed the artist Doris Salcedo. And here, Gwen Ryan from the Hirschhorn responds that SFMOMA has. 
And then when you join LinkedIn, you have the option to sign up for email updates so they can send you regular daily or even weekly posts about discussions that are happening. And this is followed by a page for promotions that you can use to post events. This works especially well to connect with allied professionals and find resources that are being used outside of the strictly conservation or preservation network. So finally, Google Plus. Um, it's described almost exactly the same way as Facebook. Um, they're almost exactly the same, but joining Google Plus has two important purposes. One is to raise your rankings in a Google search. And two is to reach a higher proportion of males who likely use this platform because it's connected directly to their Google account. And just as a side note, when I was searching for Tate's Google Plus page, I found the social media directory on their website um, here, this list on the right. And that's pretty helpful because in most cases you visit a museum website and you see these sometimes unrecognizable icons at the bottom or on the side. Um, so you may consider making a list where you've um, you've shown where someone should go if they wanted to visit any of your social media sites. So back to Google+, Plus, it's used like Facebook to post various forms of media content, videos, but the difference here is that the videos are all linked to a YouTube account, um, which takes away an extra step of organizing your YouTube videos and separately posting them to, say, Facebook. Okay, so to wrap up the first category, um, my tip number one is, if your site has analytic tools, check them often to better understand your audience. Here I have a screenshot of the institution's um, instructions, sorry, to look at Facebook's page metrics. And all these sites have some capability to tell you either how many people are clicking or how many people um, are visiting the site and where they're located. It's impossible to tell whether this corresponds to actual museum visitors or donations unless you were to ask them directly when they come to the museum. But I still think it's helpful to know that your efforts in building social media are appreciated and there are people actually visiting and hopefully learning something as well. Okay, now back to Samantha who will discuss articles and essays. Well, thank you, Heather. Um, sharing articles and essays, uh, usually in blog format, can help you to further the education portion of your institutional mission by sharing in-depth information about your collection or sharing the research of your fellows and scholars and staff. Um, the first site I'll discuss is Weebly, which is a free platform for building a website um, this could really be useful for a smaller institution that may not have an IT staff or a large budget for creating a website from scratch. What we like about Weebly is that it's incredibly easy to use, and here in the conservation world, we're using sites like this to build our online conservation portfolios that showcase the work which um, that we're doing, and then these are really easy to send along with our fellowship applications or job applications. Um, so, for lack of a better example, here's a snapshot from my um, ePortfolio uh, within the, the building tool, just to show you how easy it is to use. So, you simply um, choose what you want from this column over here at the left, and then you just drag it to wherever you want it to be on the page, and, and there it is. Um, so, it's incredibly easy, and I'm pretty sure almost anyone could use this builder. And it also has an integrated blogging feature that's equally easy to use. So this could be a great platform for starting an institutional blog if you don't have one yet. Um, I'm sure most of you have heard of WordPress, which is another very popular blogging platform. Um, this site is also extremely easy to use for the novice, and it has great site analytics, which give you a good amount of information about your viewing audience. Um, another great thing about WordPress is that can it can actually support fully fledged websites. So you see here um, an image of the Toledo Museum of Art website, and you'll notice it does not look at all like a blog. Um, so you have a lot of aesthetic freedom um, on, on WordPress as a platform. And you can see that <laughs> you'll see that it's not really the case on the next option, which is Blogger. You might have seen this platform in action if you've ever come across a blog um, with the word blogspot in the URL. 
Um, so it's now owned by Google, and they haven't quite gotten it up to the level of other platforms. Um, but just to, as an example, here is the blog for the Blanton Museum of Art. Um, and you can see it's a little static. So there, there may be better options out there for blogging, but we just wanted to uh, show you all your, <laughs> all your main options. And the next item is Wikipedia which isn't necessarily a platform for you to promote your institution, but your museum's Wikipedia page is actually quite important. So you can see here the Google search results for the MFAH, and you'll notice that our own website is the first listing, and Google Plus is taking up a lot of real estate on the right side of the page, but you'll see our Wikipedia page is the second listing. And conversely, Facebook is all the way down at the bottom in the sixth entry. And this pattern held true for every museum I test visit on. So you can see that your institution's Wikipedia page probably gets uh, a, a good deal of exposure. And for that reason, you want it to be up to date and factual. You can actually edit Wikipedia yourself. Anyone can edit it. And it's fairly easy to become involved in contributing to the collective knowledge at Wikipedia, but again, I'll stress that only encyclopedic information is allowed, so you have to be judicious with what you're posting there. Um, but having correct and complete information there and having a thorough description of the breadth of your collection can encourage people to visit your institution in person. So that brings me to tip number two, which is do your research. <laughs> You want to make sure you're posting factual information on whatever platform you're using, but especially those platforms that demand it. Um, and here I have a screenshot of Wikipedia's help page called What Wikipedia is Not. So there are plenty of resources available to help you navigate those kind of tricky areas. And now I'll turn it over to Heather, who's going to talk about sharing images. Okay, thank you. So category number three, sharing media images. So for someone like me who's passionate about art and also photography, I feel the images make a big impact toward a visually appealing site. The following websites can also store your images as a backup for preservation. They can provide access to your collection for research and engage fans by telling a unique story that you can't always tell within the restrictions of a gallery. And the best thing about sharing images is that the mentions is that they've been proven to receive the most likes, shares, and comments on social media. So keep posting images. The first site I've included here is Instagram, which has a characteristic square format and usually a filter to make the image look like it's a Polaroid or some other vintage photograph. Um, the site uh, I'm showing is George Eastman House, the world's oldest museum dedicated to photography. And as you probably expect, they post a variety of photos including this one for the institution. And this was most likely just taken with someone's phone. So if you have a camera phone, don't be afraid to just snap some shots wherever you are. Or you could also um, ask your visitors or workshop participants to take photos with their phones um, that can then be linked back to your institution like this one. Finally, you can post images from your own collection. And this second photograph was posted in honor of the American dancer and actress Louise Brooks's birthday. They actually also posted the same image to Tumblr and then linked it from Facebook but using different captions for all three sites. So this is a good way to conscientiously cross post to save time in creating and posting new content but not repeating the exact same information that may eventually bore your fans. Um, worst case scenario, though, you may lose one Tumblr fan that also follows you on Facebook and Instagram, but at least you're still reaching the fans that only subscribe to the one platform. History Pin is a really cool site, and I know some of you were interested in it, so I'm going to describe it in a bit more detail. History Pin lets you share photographic history by geographic location or organized by topic. One of the first tabs on the website is this Google map that shows you where photos have been pinned all over the world. Um, but because it's linked to Google, don't be surprised if it automatically opens up to your location. So if you click on one of the pinned photos, it pulls up an image of a location. In this case, it's the Plaza Hotel in Houston. I just showed one randomly. And if you look at this panel on the right, 
you see that it gives the exact address of the building. Um, it gives a description depending on what you put here in the caption. And then there are some tags that can link you to related images. Um, and then in, in the same window, you have a tab for Street View here or, um, or the little Street View icon at the bottom. If you click on those, it brings you to the Google Street View. And that places the historic photo or older photo in this case in front of the current Street View. And according to Google, Street Views are updated by satellite every year. So the current image must be from at least 2012. Um, if not 2013, and the older image here is only from 2005, but um, there have been images from, you know, ne or late 19th century as well. Um, and then another cool feature, if you use this little slide bar at the bottom, um, it lets you fade out the old image um, to see how the building has changed over time. So another tab on the website gives you the option to view projects that have been created by History Pin that you can become involved with. Or you can build your own channel for your institution similar to a YouTube channel. You can create a collection like maybe all images of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Or even make a slideshow tour that tells the story through time and could also incorporate audio. Lastly, if you do want to get involved, um, they have these really great instructions about ways that you can do that, some of which I've mentioned. So here's just an example from an institution. Um, this is the Smithsonian Institution Archive site. And they mostly use it to show the history of Smithsonian buildings around the mall in Washington, D.C. Here's a list of recently posted images with their descriptions, um, and then the boxes uh, include the description that they write, but they also allow the viewers to add comments. So this would be a really good place to ask for help with identifying a photo, or you could even quiz your viewers to see if they know where a specific building is located. Okay, next is Flickr, and this is mostly a repository for storing your images, but allows other people to look at them and add them to groups as long as they're set to public. Here's a Flickr page for SFMOMA showing their new on-the-go campaign while they renovate the museum building. Their entire photo stream appears here on the home page, but then you can also click um, on sets to show how uh, images are grouped by category or event. If you were to click on a specific image, um, you see more interactive options at the bottom that let you add comments, and as long as you're logged in, you can add them to groups um, or to your favorites. Just as a comparison, here's SF Moma's Flickr page and their Instagram page. Um, they both hold images, but they're not exactly the same. The Instagram page shares one-off images on a more regular basis, while Flickr groups all of the photos that were taken during an event. The other thing about Flickr is that they have a Commons page, just like Wikimedia Commons, so that groups photos that people are willing to share for educational purposes. And whether or not you're able to share your institution's images, this is a good place to find them to use for presentations or research. Next is Tumblr. And Tumblr is technically a blogging platform, but it's most commonly used to showcase images and or GIFs, short animations that fit around a theme. This is your opportunity to be a bit more cheeky or clever, because that's what's expected on Tumblr. Um, in this page, when you work in a museum, it, it allows you to post anonymous um, descriptions of experiences that you've had while working in a museum. So most of them include um, just a little bit of text and a short gif, uh, and that illustrates the point. They're mostly pretty funny, so I encourage you to check that out later if you have time. And then I also wanted to show a short advertisement they use, so every time a new page post is made, they link that to Twitter, um, so when you work at a museum's Twitter page, post the title and people can find it there and then link back to the original Tumblr, Tumblr page. And hopefully in this case, you would get people retweeting and then more traffic that goes to your site. This is another one of my favorites. My daguerreotype boyfriend uh, pulls together photographic history through the guise of attractive male portraits. So here's an example. And then this one also allows people to post their own images. Here, usually daguerreotypes encased objects 
with a short caption describing who is in the photograph and where it's from. Notice that this post um, at the bottom shows that it's from the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. So if you don't want to create your own Tumblr page, you can always advertise for your institution by contributing to another Tumblr page, just as long as it's consistent with the voice that you're trying to achieve. So to wrap up this category, my tip number three is gain permission before posting any content that may belong to someone else. This probably goes without saying, but just be sure to double check with all parties that their content, image, video, audio, etc., can be shared online. If something is not copyrighted and you think maybe it should be, the Creative Commons license will protect your ownership while still making the content available for educational purposes. I'm by no, by no means an expert in this issue, so um, I'll refer you back to Dana's webinar from last week because she had some helpful information on this topic. But I'd say when in doubt, contact legal counsel before sharing anything. Okay, so I'm going to hand it back to Samantha to tell us about audio and video. Thanks, Heather. Um, sharing video and audio is a great way to engage your audience in a medium that is very familiar to most users of social media. And it's also a great way to offer a, I'm sorry, a behind the scenes view of your institution or give your public programs a broader reach um, or even just promote your own collection. So the topic of sharing video couldn't start without talking about YouTube, which is the most ubiquitous outlet for sharing videos online. Um, you can share videos of any length, and the videos you post on YouTube can be easily cross-posted in many platforms. So it's fairly easy to embed the video in, say, Facebook or Twitter, and then the user can watch that video without actually having to leave their Facebook or, video, or, or, or Twitter page. Um, and we are going to take a moment now to watch a little one-minute video that the IMA posted in 2012, right before Indianapolis hosted Super Bowl 46. And this video is called 46 Reasons to Visit the IMA. Um, really quick. So that was um, a good little example of a museum taking advantage of a big event in their city and then using it to encourage visitors to actually come and visit the museum um, by using uh, a YouTube video. Um, and you can also have an individual channel for your institution. So here's the channel of the Art Institute of Chicago, and you can see how many subscribers they have, and all the videos they've uploaded there. Uh, next up is Vine, which is the video version of Twitter, and it was started with the same idea in mind uh, that bre brevity breeds creativity. So these videos are limited to six seconds, and they loop kind of like a, a long version of a GIF. Um, here's a screenshot <laughs> from a dance event at MoMA, and um, MoMA has a lot of um, vines out there, so that's a good option to consider for a very short video. Um, then there's iTunes, which I'm sure most people are familiar with. It's Apple's media management software. It was the birthplace of the podcast, and this is a great way to share audio or video in a long or short format. And it's fairly easy to submit a podcast to iTunes, and it's a great way to present, like, expert interviews or um, share events at your museum or your institution. 
Um, here's the podcast channel for the American Museum of Natural History, and they have some great program. And here's a screenshot of a short time-lapse video from the Whitney Museum showing the construction of their new building. So you can see there's a lot of potential for broadcasting a broad range of content to your audience through podcasting. We also wanted to briefly mention Conservation Reel, which is a project spearheaded by the Balboa Art Conservation Center in San Diego. This is a site which aggregates videos on treatments or research projects or art historical study. Um, so this is a really great idea, but it may be a little involved. Uh, you can probably get your own content out there through already established channels, but it's just something to think about if you may have a broad topic like this with a lot of video content that you think would be useful to have aggregated all in one place. Okay, so here's tip number four which is stay consistent with your tone and usage to build a regular audience. And here you see a snapshot from Pinterest, which is a site Dana discussed last week. And this is a good example of having regular scheduled programming. So this is a web series called 82nd and 5th that the museum, I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Museum is doing on Pinterest. And you can see that they're having curators choose a work of art that has changed the way they see the world. And then they're uploading a new two-minute narrated photo journal every Wednesday in 2013. And Met Museum at Pinterest has more than half a million followers on the site. So you can see that this type of regular and frequent posting is fairly successful. And now I'm going to turn it over to Heather, who will go over our last category, which is sharing ideas. Okay, thank you, Samantha. So category number five, sharing ideas. This is our last category, so um, hopefully once we wrap things up, we'll have plenty of time for your questions. Using the following sites, you can expand your reach from your front door to across the world. You can double up on your efforts by sharing presentations that were intended for only one time and location, but then um, you continue them on for people to access. You can engage with your fans by having meaningful conversations in person or through an online chat forum. So the first site is Meetup, and this works almost like online dating in that you meet people with similar interests and you schedule an in-person get-together, usually with a larger group. Here's an example, Glam Cafe in Philadelphia, which stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives, and Museums, um, and it's sponsored by Philadelphia Digital Humanities and the Chemical Heritage Foundation. So through Glam Cafe, this group of people can schedule local events and track who all is attending. And if you find a similar group in your area, these types of events could easily take place at your institution and build interest within the community. So it's more targeting your local um, patrons rather than tourists and people uh, spread throughout the world. You also have the option to start your own meetup group and promote your activities with these easy steps here. Some of them the traditional steps like printing out flyers. And what's so great about meetup is that these people who join are really enthusiastic and they're prepared to help a cause. So that's perfectly suited to maybe an angels project or a salvage and recovery following an emergency. Next is SlideShare, um, and this provides a location to post a PowerPoint presentation and the means to either give it live in a meeting or keep it up for people to view and borrow later on. And you can set it to private, so it can only um, be seen by those people you share it with. Um, it can be public for anyone who searches um, and finds it on SlideShare. So this here is the outreach presentation provided by the American Institute for Conservation, and it gives an overview of what conservation is. So I've actually used this, um, or a modified version of this, several times when speaking to art history students, um, but it's previously only on the AIC website available to members, and now here it is available to everyone. If you look just below the slides, you have um, a couple different screens. One is a transcript of all the text that was on your slide. Uh, and then there's also a box that shows the notes that you had typed in. So if you want to post something without the notes, you'd have to take those off before you upload it. And then here at the left, left are the analytics features that include things like how many views it's had, how many times it's been embedded, downloads, um, et cetera. 
Okay, and then finally, uh, webinar tools. So um, someone is asking about Skype, and I think uh, Skype would fit in, in this type of category. Um, it's a place where you're sharing ideas online through like a chat type of forum. So my first example is Google Plus Hangouts. Um, so if you already have an account on Google Plus, this is easy to use. And this shot is from a webinar on establishing a private practice hosted by the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network um, of AIC. It's Okay, hi everyone. Are you able to hear me now? Just type a quick yes in the box if you can. Um, I'm sorry, it looks like we lost audio, so I'm not really sure where we um, left off, but I think I'm just going to start here with the webinar software. Hopefully I'm not repeating anything. Um, so back to the example, uh, Google Plus Hangouts, um, as well as any meeting or go to meeting in here, I would maybe group Skype in as well because it's a type of conferencing software. Um, and then maybe also Adobe software that the Connecting to Collections site uses. These all bring a large group of people together and share a presentation or a screen view. This shot is from a webinar on establishing a private practice, and it was hosted by the Emerging Conservation Professionals Network of AIC using Google Plus Hangouts. And the recording is now up on YouTube. What they did was more of a conversation than a presentation, so they just chatted. Um, and you can see the person that's in the large image at the top is currently speaking, and the other presenters are in uh, the smaller boxes at the bottom. Then also with any meeting or go-to meeting, uh, you can use them for webinars and conferencing. I would double check if they have any fees involved just um, for the number of users and things like that. Um, but they're great in that they provide features to advertise your event um, in advance. Okay, to wrap up category five, uh, my tip is to think about how your audience will interpret your content. So my main caution here is with sharing too much expert advice on conservation treatments that a viewer might try at home, um, but they wouldn't have experienced supervisors and they wouldn't have AIC code of ethics there. So uh, you never know, it could be a little bit dangerous. And I just always imagine my mom as my audience and what I would want her to take away from my lesson. And that method also seems to help um, to make my tone a little bit more casual and add extra explanations when I'm using too much conservation jargon. 
you could always recommend the Find a Conservator feature on the AIC website if you um, meet someone that has specific needs uh, with an object. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Samantha one last time. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, here are the five tips we've gone over so far. And lastly, we'd like to add tip number six. that you think are best suited to your institution. Um, don't feel pressured to immediately go out and use every site and connect with every potential fan in the world. Um, just focus your energy on a few sites at first and build from there. And also we recommend that you follow other institutions to see how they're using social media to get their content out there and to reach their audience. You can learn from their outreach approach as well as engaging with them directly through these platforms um, by using at mentions or retweeting that might help you both gain some new followers. So we'll leave you with a few resources to help you get going, both from Dana's webinar as well as today's. Um, and Jenny, if there are any questions, we could take those. Um, I do see Karen was asking about copyright issues, um, which was um, covered a little bit more in Dana's webinar, so we definitely recommend that you go back and um, take a look at that. And there's also a website that was recommended during that webinar, um, and it's posted on this resources, this resources page right here. Yeah, copyright issues are tough. There's sort of this fine line between wanting to share everything um, so that people can learn and wanting to share nothing because it's so risky that, you know, you're going to share something that you shouldn't have. Um, so, yeah, I would just, again, consult the website and any legal counsel that you have if you just have any doubts at all. But, but you're right in that the social media sites um, sometimes retain rights over content. You have the artist or the foundation of the artist. Um, you have your own institution, you have people that you're sharing from, so again, just it's complicated, um, but hopefully that doesn't deter you from using these sites because people are actually learning from them. Great, guys, and thank you for handling that audio uh, cutout like pros. Um, let's see, so Marcia, um, I think you guys cover the Skype versus Google Hangout uh, as a means for video conferencing. Do you guys have a preference? Um, I'm not positive, um, but I do think that um, if you want to have a multiple kind of a conference call on Skype, I think you may have to have a, on like a more like a paid account. Um, I'd have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure Google Hangouts is free. Am I right? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's also true. I mean, in my experience, I've used Skype more with making calls to one person. But yeah, it also has conferencing features. Mm -hmm. um, and then the good thing about Google Plus Hangouts is that it's already linked to your Google account. So, you know, you don't have the process of adding extra software to your phone or your computer. You're just sort of already there. Um, but in both cases, you can share documents um, and screen views. So I'd say both good ideas. Okay, and then um, a question from Dave. He's curious is, uh, do you guys know if History Pin is widely viewed and well supported? Um, okay, um, so I'll answer that. Um, and I'm not sure how many people use it. If you looked at the number of likes on the Smithsonian Institution site, I think it was in the hundreds. Um, so it's not used by everyone. I actually learned about it. I was taking um, an outreach course at the University of Delaware, and they told us about it um, as sort of a marketing feature. And then from there, I've used it more um, and tried to share it with more people. So I think maybe eventually it will be more widely spread. But if you were to advertise that from your website, then it would be easy for people to get there and to see what you've posted. Yeah. Um, as someone who's downloaded uh, downloaded the app, I can share that it is an incredibly neat idea and incredibly um, an interesting uh, product that you can go anywhere, pull up images wherever you are of um, uh, historical images, but there are a few kinks I've noticed. Uh, but it, it seems like it might be something that's going to evolve. Um, in the future into something bigger. So something to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting that you can bring your phone and just stand in front of the building and pull up historic photos of the building. That's really a great way to use it just personally. 
so cool. It's so cool. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and pull over the um, evaluation for this webinar. Um, we have a few more minutes, so feel free if you have any more questions uh, for Samantha or Heather, um, go ahead and type them in now. Um, and if you can uh, fill out our evaluation, that would be fantastic. Uh, you guys are a wealth of information when it comes uh, to finding new topics to cover. All right, I'm going to give it just a few more seconds to see if anyone has any questions. Okay. And if anyone um, does have any questions later on, um, they can feel free to email us. We can put our um, email addresses up there. Um, as Samantha probably mentioned, we're not experts, but um, we can just offer our opinions and advice with things that we've used. And we will um, take some of the, or all the links from this PowerPoint and we'll pull them out and put them on the web post for this. So you'll have a quick one-stop shop place to get all these links. So I think I think that's it. Heather and Samantha, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jenny, and thanks everyone for attending. Final webinar for this year um, is uh, Tuesday, December 10th at 2 o'clock. If you're interested in the conservation assessment program, you're interested in learning more about it, uh, make sure to join us. So we'll be spending an hour talking about CAPS. Um, again, that's Tuesday, December 10th at 2 p.m. Thank you all so much uh, for joining us today and have a fantastic afternoon. All right.